Okay, well, good morning or afternoon, whatever it might be. We're ready to start our next chapter, um, which is going to skip forward in your books if you use those for reference uh, to chapter 19, which looks at bacteria and viruses. Uh, we're going to break this down to where um, we'll spend the first half looking at bacteria, uh, the last half for the most part looking at viruses, and then collectively look at diseases caused by both bacteria and viruses. So let's start with bacteria. Uh, as we have talked about, bacteria are prokaryotic cells. That is, they are always single-celled. They lack a nucleus. Even though they do have DNA, it's in a single large chromosome or one big loop, essentially. It lacks all of those complex membrane-bound organelles like the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticula, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, so forth. They still have ribosomes, which they can synthesize proteins with, but otherwise they lack those more complex structures that we see in eukaryotic organisms like plants and animals. And they're smaller. They're one to five micrometers or microns uh, on average, and that's a millionth of a meter. So they're, they're very, very small. Um, your cells are generally bigger than bacteria cells by a bit. Um, for example, here's about five microns. These are bacteria on the head of a pen or the point of a pen. Um, the, if you look at this, um, each one of those orange colored things is one single bacterial organism. And this metal on here, even though it should look really sharp and pointy because it's so magnified so much, it just looks like this rough, this rough surface, but that is metal. And that is bacteria on the metal, which really explains a lot. Because they're so small, if you get a splinter or a little piece of wood or a thorn or something underneath your skin, it gets infected. And it gets infected because these bacteria, because they're so small, can get transmitted from that material that gets underneath your skin, under your skin, and through your body's defenses, and then cause problems for you, like that infection. Your body responds to that. So I always thought this was a pretty good image to just really relate how incredibly small bacteria are. Um, here's another way of viewing this. Uh, a human hair, for example, is about 17 microns in diameter on average. Uh, a fungal hyphae, you know, like a single fungal strand, can be one to 40 across. A bacteria is one to five micrometers or microns. And we're gonna be talking about viruses. We need to point out that viruses are you know, 0.2 to 0.3 microns. So they're quite a bit smaller than a bacteria, right? Don't think we lump together bacteria and viruses. Do not think they are at all the same thing. They're, they're really not. Um, and we'll, we'll really point that out when we talk more about viruses themselves. Here's another scale. So what you can see with the naked eye here is people and eggs, frog eggs, human eggs. You can just, you would be able to see a human cell um, on a human ovum, It'd be very small, but you could you could see it. You cannot really see individual plant and animal cells. That's just too small for us to see. But you could see it easily with a light microscope, as we have looked at in class. But whenever you get down to about bacteria size, um, you can see them, but they are very rather small. Um, we'll be able to see those in class through a microscope. And we'll be able to see the individual bacteria, but we won't be able to like see any sort of structures on the inside, like we may have been able to see on a plant or animal cell. And then when you drop down to a viruses, it's another uh, quite a bit smaller nanometers instead of micrometers, that is billionths of a meter instead of millionths of a meter. Um, they're a bit smaller. And then we get down to proteins and lipids and atoms and so forth. So keep in mind, this is a logarithmic scale. And so these increases are significant between each one. What I'm saying is bacteria are small, viruses are smaller. And that's why we can't see them. When we start looking at bacteria as a whole, there are two divisions. So whenever we start say divisions, we really mean two different kingdoms. So there's like the kingdom of plants or animals or protists or fungus. Those are four different kingdoms. We have two other kingdoms, 
that are the bacterial kingdoms, the eubacteria and the archaebacteria. Now they used to be grouped together. We, we didn't have, when, when I was a kid, we didn't have six kingdoms, we had five kingdoms. And these two groups were say, looking through microscopes, we said these look exactly the same. But whenever they were able to start looking at these more closely, and especially looking at what their DNA said, they said, well, there's a big difference between these two different groups, even though they may look a little bit alike. Um, think of it this way, a shark and a dolphin look a lot alike, but they're really utterly, totally different on the inside. And so it is true with the eubacteria and the archaebacteria, they really rely on some different cellular machinery and different DNA to make it happen, even though they look a lot alike. So they were grouped together until the 90s under one group called the Monarans. Um, but we've realized that they're definitely distinct from one another. I want to highlight here some of the differences between these two different groups of bacteria. Probably would be better to say two different groups of pro, uh, prokaryotes. So to begin off, we have the eubacteria or the common, what I call the common bacteria. These are very, very widespread. This is the, all the main types of bacteria that you and I might talk about. Like we might talk about E. coli or uh, strep throat is caused by a streptococcus, which is a type of eubacteria. Um, the type of bacteria that's used in to make yogurt, like lactobacillus, or uh, there's well, there's a bunch of them. If you ever, by the way, if you ever look at yogurt, um, it says live and active cultures on it. That's really bacteria. You're eating bacteria. Um, bacteria is used to make cheese. It's all this different varieties of eubacteria. They're very, very widespread. You've got like 500 different types of bacteria living in your mouth and gut right now as it is. You've got more bacterial cells in you and on you than you have human cells. So they're, they're, very, they're very common, all right? Now, what do all you, ba you bacteria have in common is they have a cell wall, like a plant or like a fungus, but instead of having cellulose or chitin, they use a different complex carbohydrate called peptidoglycan, right? So that is what forms this, helps to form this cell wall that surrounds each of these bacteria. And all you bacteria use this material. Here's a fun fact. The antibiotic penicillin, which helps to kill bacteria, right? Some of you might be allergic to penicillin. Well, in bacteria, you bacteria, penicillin causes them not to be able to manufacture peptidoglycan. It inhibits the formation of their cell wall, which basically leaves them defenseless. It'd be like if a plant didn't have cell walls around it, that plant cell would dry up or break or something like that. It loses all of its protection and it allows your body to fight off the bacteria. That's how penicillin actually works is by getting rid of this particular material that all you bacteria have. All right, so that's, that's a pretty cool way of looking at this. Archaebacteria, on the other hand, do not have peptidoglycan in their cell wall. They use very different membrane lipids and their DNA is actually closer to looking at eukaryotic DNA. So that's like plant, animal, and fungus DNA. Um, one of the interesting things about archaebacteria is because they have very different DNA, they get to do different things. We know that DNA is your genetic code. It determines your traits, your characteristics. And in this case, having different DNA allows it to have the cellular machinery to live in some really odd places. Um, some, sometimes archaebacteria are called the are extremophiles. File means love something. Um, some are halophiles. They love really salty areas like archaebacteria can live in extremely salty water where regular eubacteria can't live like the Great Salt Lake um, or Lake Mono in California. Thermophiles love heat. They can live in hot springs where any other form of life would be cooked and would die. They can survive there. Chemophiles love chemicals. They can live in really toxic or high metal environments that any other bacteria would be killed by or any other form of life would be killed by. So these different archaebacteria have the ability to live in really radical places. We used to not think that there would be life in certain areas, but anytime you go to these really odd, weird places like hot springs in Yellowstone, we think, oh, there shouldn't be anything living there. And it turns out there are, and it's usually these, it is these archaebacteria that are able to live there. 
like this. There's, here's an example. Here's a hot spring. You would think, oh, doesn't look like there'd be much living out here where it's really hot. You could see some of the green algae growing there, but even here, there's a bunch of archaebacteria living here. Okay, so how prevalent are bacteria? What is their occurrence rate? Um, well, they're really, really common. Um, there's about 40 million individual little bacterium in one gram of soil. So that one gram of soil is what you would expect in like maybe a teaspoon, if you will. Um, on your body, they outnumber your total, your body's cells. So you know, five times 10 to the 30th total estimated population, um, that's a lot, right? So this just in your guts, which is full of bacteria, um, you have all these different varieties of organisms, of different groups of bacteria living at different places in your digestive system, mainly in your lower intestine and colon. Uh, that's where you, you know, you compress waste and the bacteria actually live there and break, help you break it down. So it's a lot of different bacteria living there. Uh, here's an example of a bunch of bacteria that would probably be like on living on your teeth. Notice they've secreted these protein webs to kind of hold themselves in place. So that way they don't get brushed off so easily. They're, they're really, really common. We're covered with them. And keep in mind, that's natural. It would be unnatural for us to not have them. If we didn't have those bacteria in our guts, we wouldn't absorb nutrients as well. We wouldn't, they actually make some vitamins for us. So this is not a bad thing. It's only bad when it's a bacteria that hurts you. And most bacteria don't. Okay, um, as far as bacteria go, they, in nature, they exist in what we call biofilms or living films, okay? Bacteria in nature aren't just like single bacteria out by themselves. They tend to like clump and cluster together. And here's a really good image of that. You can once again see those little networks of proteins anchoring the bacteria in place. Now, in some places, they can get really, really thick, like in parts of you know, the ocean or something like that. But most of the times they aren't that thick. They're really thin films. And it's not just typically a single species, it's multiple species working together, which provides protection from them. And really the best example is what's on your teeth right now, unless you br totally brushed your teeth this morning, which I sure hope you did, right? So that's that tartar that forms on your teeth is just natural bacteria in your mouth they're forming a biofilm on your teeth so they can hold themselves in place. Different bacteria help do different things on this. And that's just a natural thing that they do. Think of it like a little microscopic forest, if you will. Um, in a forest, you have big trees and shrubs and little trees, and they all do different things. That's kind of how this is, except microscopic. All right. So, um, as far as identifying bacteria, um, how do we go about ID IDing or identifying bacteria? Well, A, we look at their overall general structure. Um, and that shape helps to identify them. And there are three main shapes, um, what we call the spherical or coxy bacteria, the bacilli or rod-shaped bacteria, and the spirilla or corkscrew type bacteria. Um, we also then look at how they lump together. If two are lumped together, they, we call them a diplo whatever, like a diplococcus. Um, or if they are clustered together like grapes, we call them a staphylo whatever. So you may have heard of a staph infection. That is a staphylococcus. It is a bacteria that clumps together and they're little round balls like these guys. Right. Um, there are many different types of Staphylococcus bacteria. The one that can cause really bad staph infections is called Staphylococcus aureus, which is really common, um, but some strains of it or varieties of it, you know, really cause problems. Strep throat would be a Streptococcus. They're linked together in chains. So by looking at these just by what we can see under a microscope, and these are really nice, nice images. We won't get these good of images. We can still see whether they're Strepto, whatever or staphylo, whatever, and we will be able to see coxy or bacilli bacteria um, underneath a microscope. Um, it's fairly straightforward to see as long as you have enough of them. We don't see spirilla as much. 
Uh, however, as an example, the bacteria that causes Lyme's disease is a spiral shaped bacteria. All right, so the shape helps identify them. You will need to know these three main shapes. You'll have to know that. Here's another, some more images of these. Uh, what do you think this one is? This is what helps you make cheese, by the way. Is if, you've, is if anyone has done this, you'll know you can buy cheese culture. You mix a little bit of a white powder in with the cheese. It's really just bacteria. They start eating the cheese and convert it to from milk. Uh, they produce lactic acid, and then it's able to preserve your cheese. All right. Um, here's some other different forms of bacteria that you can see. And we'll probably stop there for right now, and we'll pick up again with, with this next time.